Hello? My name is Barbara Geddes. I'm the chair of the political science department. I'm very pleased to welcome you here tonight for, you heard it here, our lecture series on contemporary politics. So we're incredibly pleased to have Ben Rhodes, one of Obama's most important speechwriters and policy advisors, speaking to us tonight. Before we get started, I want to make one announcement, which is that Ben will be signing copies of his recent book in the lobby after the talk, and we'll have copies of the book for sale. So now I'd like to turn the mic over to Professor Michael Ross, who will introduce Ben Rhodes. Thank you, Barbara, and thanks very much for joining us tonight. Um, we're very excited to, to have Ben Rhodes with us. Um, ben has a, uh, a long career in politics, uh, starting with work for the Giuliani campaign in 1997 uh, in New York. So he's evolved. Uh, um, he, uh, he's, of course, best known as a speechwriter and then eventually deputy national security advisor for President Obama. He was part of the Obama, he joined as uh, uh, the Obama campaign in 2007 and was in the Obama administration from January 20th, 2008 to January 20th, 2016. Um, he has written a, um, a best-selling and, and uh, widely acclaimed memoir, The World As It Is, which as Barbara said, he'll be signing copies of afterward uh, in the lobby. Um, it was reviewed by Joe Klein in the New York Times book review as um, an achievement that is rare for a political memoir, a book that is both humane and honorable. And George Packer in The New Yorker wrote, this is the closest view of Obama we're likely to get until he publishes his own memoir. He's since become a high profile political commentator on foreign policy and other issues. Um, he's a regular contributor to MSNBC uh, and NBC News. He's co-host of Pod Save America, and we're delighted to have him as a uh, uh, part of our um, instructors, part of our professors this quarter, uh, teaching UCLA undergraduates, and we're delighted he's with us tonight. So please join me in welcoming Ben Rhodes. Thanks. Great. Um, well, thanks so much uh, for being here. I'm going to try this up here instead of from the podium. Uh, give a kind of an Oprah feel to it. Um, and uh, thanks for the introduction, uh, except for the Rudy Giuliani mention. Uh, I have to just stress I was 19 years old. <laughs> uh, you know, testing the waters. Uh, he was a slightly different guy back then, but the warning signs were, were there. Um, so I'll just kind of give uh, some remarks about you know, what's in my book and about kind of where we've been and I think where we are right now. Um, I, I guess I'll begin, um, you know, a, a quote from the book that got a lot of attention is, uh, I start the book at the end of the Obama presidency and we're on the final motorcade drive uh, after the last foreign trip that Obama was on. And uh, I'm sitting in the presidential limousine with President Obama and I actually wasn't wearing any socks um, because I'd had a late night the night before and my wife's here so she won't appreciate me telling the story, but I, I you know, forgot to take out socks from my bag and I put it outside, so Obama is just ripping on me relentlessly about the fact that I'm not wearing these socks. Um, but then it kind of turned serious and you know, he was always kind of paging through his iPad in the back of the, the limousine commenting on things that caught his attention and he looks up at me and he says, uh, what if we were wrong? Um, and I said, well, wrong about what? And he said, well, what if, what if we were wrong? What if people just want to fall back into their tribe? Uh, what if people just want to fall back into their traditional identity? Um, and I realized this was a much more serious conversation than about my socks. Um, and I said, no, 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 of course we weren't wrong. Uh, you know, you got elected twice. You would have gotten elected a third time if you could have run again. Um, and he said, well, maybe, um, but uh, you know, maybe we forgot how much identity matters to people. And we started to have this conversation about 
you know, which is the latest iteration of our response to the election. And we've been through all the stages of grief of the election. You know, was it the Russians? Was it the Jim Comey letter? Should Hillary have gone to Wisconsin more? Um, and, you know, Obama, uh, you know, was getting more and more frustrated. The economy is growing. 20 million people have health care. The Iranians don't have a nuclear weapon. You know, it was all teed up. And now this. Um, and that question, what if we were wrong, kind of hangs over the whole book because it gets at really the existential question of where we are in our politics in our world today, which is, are we headed to a future that is defined by an inclusive, progressive brand of politics and society that Barack Obama represents as much as any other human being? Or are we headed towards a nationalist, authoritarian, exclusive us versus them uh, society and in international order and no human being represents that as well as Donald Trump. Uh, and so we're really balanced at, at this precipice. Um, and you, know, you could feel this conflict building in the eight years we were there. Um, and it will shape uh, how we resolve that question, because I actually don't think it's fully resolved. I'll come back to that at the end. Will shape not just our country. It will shape what happens around the world um, for the foreseeable future, for generations. I'll focus on foreign policy, because uh, that was what I focused on in the White House. And I, I want to just give a kind of overview of how we saw the world changing during the eight years that we were in office, and how we tried to deal with that, how we tried to respond to that. I'll start with a story uh, to get at the point that the, what we call the international order, how the world works politically, economically, how much it was already changing at the beginning of the Obama administration. Essentially, what you'd had is the twin catastrophes of the Iraq war and the global financial crisis had already really knocked us back in terms of how the world looked at American leadership. Had also, frankly, especially the financial crisis, opened the door to some of the kind of right-wing populism that we've seen building ever since. But I'll start with the trip we made to Copenhagen in 2009 for a climate change summit. And this was supposed to be what became the Paris Agreement. We thought you know, the US is rejoining the global climate negotiations. We'll take what used to be the Kyoto Protocol. The US will join. We'll get an agreement. By the time we arrived at that summit, it had fallen apart. Uh, I've never walked into a situation like that in eight years. Literally, none of the leaders are meeting. It's chaos. People are wandering around the halls. There's clearly not going to be any agreement reached. And what was apparent is that none of the developing countries, none of the emerging countries, wanted to sign on to any climate change agreement because their basic approach was, all of you rich countries made this problem. It's your problem. Why should we have to do anything? And so we thought, well, we have to sit down with the Chinese and the Russians and the Indians and the Brazilians and all these other countries and, and try to get them at least into some kind of framework that can become a global climate change agreement. And we couldn't find these countries. And so finally, Obama says, I'm just going to go find the premier of China, this guy, Wen Bao, myself. And so we walked to where we knew the Chinese had their kind of offices. And Chinese security literally seeks to prevent us from entering this space. Now, if you're Barack Obama and you have Secret Service protection, you can kind of plow right through that. If you're five foot seven and you're me, you can't. And I literally got knocked to the ground. I'm like kind of reaching up. Will somebody help me? There's people trampling over me. Like I've got you know, Hillary Clinton is walking over me. Um, <laughs> so it was a bit humiliating. But uh, I, I get myself up, and, and I see Obama walk into this room and say, literally, are you ready for me when, uh, to the Chinese premier? You know, kind of about as mano mano as foreign policy gets. It's usually pretty boring. Um, and I walk in, and the Chinese premier is chairing a meeting with the president of Russia, the prime minister of India, the president of Brazil, the president of South Africa, and literally telling them what to do. This is 2009. Obama sits there for an hour and literally hammers out this idea that, well, you guys are going to have to do something for there to be a climate change agreement. It's going to have to have the goal of at least no more than two degrees Celsius in terms of global warming. Everybody's going to have to do something, but maybe the rich countries can pay into a fund that can help the, the poorer countries, and we'll work this out in the years to come. And literally, almost on the back of a napkin, they sketch out what seven years later became the Paris Climate Accords. And I remember flying back with Obama from this trip and saying to him, you know, there's this kind of fashionable thing in the, Washington to say that the Chinese are rising. 
I'm like, they seem to have risen. Uh, people miss this. Uh, they're already here. You know, while we were fighting a war in Iraq and you know, while we were bringing about a financial crisis, the Chinese are already in a position where they had more influence, they had more sway at that summit than we did. This is at the beginning of the Obama years. So the first point I want to make is that the world was already changing in 2000, by 2009. Uh, sometimes it takes us several years to see the, the results, uh, but we could see them in that, in that room at that time. The, the second point, though, I want to make about how the, this international order works is that just because it's changing doesn't mean that there's some other country that wants to take the place of the United States. The Chinese don't want to be worrying about every country in the Middle East, right? They're, they're not looking to supplant us. And, and an example I give for this is, is a different summit that we went to, the G20 summit, um, the summit of the 20 largest economies in the world. We're meeting in France in 2012. And this is a height of the Eurozone crisis. Uh, the, the, the European Union was growing sluggishly, and there was a risk that Greece could default on all of its debt, crash out of the European Union, and pull the whole global economy down into the soup once again. Uh, this was the dynamic heading into this summit. Uh, and again, I should add, this sluggish growth, this inability to climb out of the uh, financial crisis, already beginning to see the rise of right-wing populism in Europe and in the United States, because that's what the Tea Party was. It was people who found a language to talk about economic grievances and grievances generally in response to the financial crisis. So th th these forces are already entering our politics, and we're thinking, if, we, if the European Union goes down, essentially, they're going to pull us down with, a, with them. And by the way, then Obama's not going to get reelected. So we're pretty worried about this. The trendy thing to say, kind of in the press leading up to the summit, is, well, maybe the Chinese, the new big kid on the block, will come in and just write a big check and bail everybody out. And the European leaders had traveled to China to kind of float this idea. The Chinese kind of liked it being out there. We get to the summit, and there are meetings all day. It's kind of boring, typical summit. Then the real meeting happens after the summit. So Obama has a dinner with all the key European leaders. Uh, and the European Union leaders, and it was only the leaders. So I'm sitting in some room outside of it. And it ended up being a pretty extraordinary meeting because they basically decided that the Italian Prime Minister Berlusconi had to step down because he was a mess, and then they put together a huge package to stabilize Greece, and they were literally designing, again, this stabilization package, still dealing with the residue of the financial crisis. And Obama emails me, because uh, that's what he did when you get bored in these meetings, and... <laughs> He's like, uh, hey, uh, remember that whole thing about the Chinese coming in and saving uh, the global economy here? And I said, yeah. Uh, and he said, I don't see Hu Jintao anywhere at this meeting. He must, not have, he must have lost the invitation. Um, and the point he was making is the Chinese don't want to do that. They, they don't want to take the position of the United States. They just want to look out for Chinese interests. And there's a lot of reasons for that including the fact that the Chinese feel like they've been dealt a raw deal by the West for centuries, and why should they have to pay into the international order? Why should they have to play by a set of rules that somebody else wrote? Um, logical reasons, but the bottom line is, when you hear these questions about, well, China's rising and we're coming down, it's not that simple, because the Chinese are rising in a way that does not want to place them at the center of an international order that works to solve lots of different problems, like a Eurozone crisis, or a Middle Eastern war, or counterterrorism challenges, or an Ebola epidemic in Africa. And so the US is still the only country, uh, when I was in uh, government, that had a sense of global responsibility. It doesn't mean we always got it right, but we were the only ones who were going to sit in that room with the Europeans and try to figure out uh, how to solve their economic crisis, going to sit in the room with a bunch of countries and the Iranians to try to figure out what to do with their nuclear program. There was still this role for the United States that was different than any other country. Leads to a third point, which is the challenge to that international order led by the United States coming not from China, but from Russia and from far-right politics generally. Now, this is something that had been building for some time for us sitting in the White House, when Vladimir Putin returned to the Russian presidency in 2012, he came back clearly determined 
to push back on what he had seen as 20 years of humiliation of Russia since the end of the Cold War. The steady expansion of the European Union, the steady expansion of NATO, uh, revolutions in places like, uh, well, initially Georgia, eventually Ukraine, which I'll get to. And so he immediately started to push back. And you saw that manifest itself in how he behaved in Syria uh, and propping up Assad. Uh, you saw that in him taking an Edward Snowden, kind of thumbing his nose at the United States. But again, most dramatically, you saw it after the Ukrainian government fell. And so what you had is a Russian-backed Ukrainian government that was totally corrupt and protests in the streets in 2014 that toppled that leader. He fled to Russia. And then all the gloves were off from the Russians. If you want to know where the Russian interference in our election, where all of this is rooted, it's in the fact that Putin saw us as responsible for the toppling of that Ukrainian government. He did not draw any distinction between Ukraine and Russia, because in Putin's mind, Ukraine should be a part of Russia. And he thought, if this can work in Ukraine, it's going to happen in Moscow next. And I'm not going to let that happen. So I'm going to go into all these countries. I'm going to go into these European countries, and I'm going to go into the United States. And I'm going to go on offense against them. And that's kind of what we live with. And, and, and obviously, the clearest manifestation of that was the information space and the social media space, where what he kind of figured out is, well, you all in the West have built all of these social media platforms that are totally open and totally unregulated. And so there's nothing that can stop me and an army of trolls from essentially cracking your guys' algorithms and making sure that anybody who's got a Facebook account or a Twitter account or who does a Google search is more likely to see the information I want them to see. And the examples I'll give for this um, Angela Merkel, when we met with her in 2016, you know, she had huge challenges around taking in enormous amounts of refugees. And that created a lot of political difficulty for her. And I sat down with her and, and, and some of her people, and, and her spokesman said to me, here's how this happens, the Russian interference. There will be a story in the press about a Syrian refugee who raped a German woman. And it will cause huge protests and uproar. People out in the streets, political fallout. What does this mean for Angela Merkel? Because she took in these refugees. And after a few days, they'll figure out that it never happened. Like literally, the, the crime never took place. And then they'll kind of trace, well, where did this come from? And they'll find some social media account that started spreading this. And the server is not in Germany, by the way. It's in some part of the former Soviet Union, right? By the time they correct it, nobody cares. Like all the damage is done. Nobody listens to the correction. Nobody listens to the fact check as we are living through today. Um, and, and so and this, this is just one indication. We met with Prime Minister Renzi of Italy, who had an important referendum coming up. He was trying to reform the Italian constitution. He's a young progressive leader. And there was an all out assault from Russia on that effort. And what he found is the Russians were so sophisticated that they would take individual members of Renzi's parliamentary coalition and create little scandals around them in, their, in the places where they, they lived, um, and, you know, the districts they represented, and you know, corruption scandals or, or what have you. Uh, and this was kind of <coughs> dividing his coalition and undermining the people who had to carry his message. Ultimately, he lost that referendum. Obviously, uh, the example everybody knows is, is our election, where what they essentially did is they said, well, all we have to do is look at what's on Breitbart. And if there's a bunch of stories about Hillary Clinton being corrupt or a bunch of stories about Hillary Clinton being in poor health, we'll just create an enormous volume of the same story so that more of that content is being shared. And so if you live in Wisconsin and you Google Hillary Clinton, that's what's coming up. And, and so he's just pushing into the open space of our democratic societies uh, to, to manipulate and change public opinion. Uh, but he's doing it, again, interestingly, aware of what the pre-existing <coughs> divisions are in our society and what the pre-existing narratives are that he can just kind of surf uh, to get done what he wants to get done. And I think the important point to make with respect to the international order is this is not just Putin or even Trump, who I'll get to in a second, there's a whole building wave of far right and authoritarian governance in all parts of the world that reject 
what I just spoke about in Copenhagen or in Khan at the G20. They reject a rules-based international order in which everybody is a stakeholder in, in a set of efforts to solve problems, whether that's an Iranian nuclear agreement or whether that's a Paris Climate Accord or whether that's coordinating to pull the global economy out from the hole that it was in or whether that's a joint effort uh, to respond to the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. These leaders, these politicians, want to go back to a place where there are no rules and everybody can do what they want. They can do what they want within their own borders and treat their people however they want to treat them uh, and where there's not obligations on people to do things in a cooperative and kind of shared uh, responsibility manner around the world. The world order that has done a pretty good job at a, at a minimum avoiding world wars um, and at a maximum really promoting expanded peace and prosperity since the end of World War II. That's the building trend, right? That leads to you know, the presidency of Donald Trump. And what was interesting for me, and I write about this in the book, is on Obama's last foreign trip, Everyone around the world had this figured out. <laughs> you know, because in other countries, there's no obligation to do the kind of both sides thing. And well, they say, you know, Trump says he, you know, maybe he'll be a, a normal president. Or they knew that for the first time in seven years, the US president was no longer going to be, forget a leader, even a, a supporter of the international order that the United States had built. And you know, we started in Greece, and it was kind of depressing because we planned to give this big speech outside with the backdrop of the Acropolis, the birthplace of democracy. And you know, my job was to think about the messaging, and I was like, we better move that speech inside. <laughs> uh, we did it in an auditorium like this. Um, a, little, a little bigger crowd for Barack Obama. But um, <laughs> then um, we went to Germany, and this was a, you know, a really interesting meeting because Obama met with Angela Merkel for like three and a half hours. It was the longest time he's ever spent just one-on-one -on -one alone with a leader. And we're all in the next room. And you know, in the back, you have the Brandenburg Gate, you have the German parliament. I mean, Germany is kind of the heart of where authoritarian politics can go wrong. And that's kind of lurking in the backdrop. And Obama told us after you know, that Merkel had said to him, essentially, she wasn't going to run for another term. Um, you know, she's done her three terms. But her whole life's work as an East German and who's been through German unification, her whole life's work was a European project. Her whole life's work was a democratic, small d, democratic international order. And with Brexit and Trump, she's like, I got to stick this out. And she asked Obama for advice. And he said, Angela, just find some high ground and hunker down, <laughs> you know, um, which is kind of what she's done. Um, and then I remember when he said goodbye to her uh, the next day, leaving for the airport, she had a, a tear in her eye. And if you've met Angela Merkel, she's the last person in the world who you'd expect to, to cry. And he said to us on the plane, you know, poor Angela, she's, she's all alone. And then we got to uh, our last stop in Peru before I lost my socks. We met with the 12 countries that we negotiated this Trans-Pacific Partnership with this trade agreement. And you know, by the way, some of these countries had you know, changed their whole economies and changed their laws. Uh, just to be able to enter in this agreement, we kind of badgered them to do all these things. And Trump has already said he's going to pull out. And, and they're all kind of apologizing. Well, we'll probably just kind of do this agreement without the United States. Um, and you could sense the extent to which that was so abnormal that there was no leader. Right? These 12 countries, well, we'll just try to go figure this out on our own without you guys. And then Obama meets uh, Justin Trudeau uh, in the last meeting. He's this kind of young, earnest, exciting, progressive politician, but looking a little shell-shocked. And you know, Obama says to him, like, uh, look, Justin, you're probably going to have to speak up a little bit more <laughs> when certain values are threatened around the world. And I, I think you've seen that on refugees and other things. And I remember Trudeau saying, uh, you know, I, I didn't intend to do that. I'm the Canadian prime minister. The Canadian prime minister doesn't usually do those things. Um, but I, I get what you're saying. And, and he said, you know, I modeled my campaign on yours, and uh, I, I feel almost obligated. Uh, and he had a good line. He said, I'll fight them with a smile on my face, because that's the only way you win. Um, but it still felt like everybody was talking themselves into, how are we going to deal with the world in which the United States is no longer playing this role? And you know, as we reached the plane after the conversation I referenced earlier, you know, Obama said to me, and you know, we're about to find out how resilient our institutions are at home and around the world. 
And you know, if you look at the, the results, it's been pretty much what you would think. Um, you know, Trump internationally has set about kind of systematically changing the role that the United States plays. Um, you know, he starts with leaving all the Obama agreements, the Iran deal, the Paris Accords, the trans pacific Partnership. He moves on to you know, a bunch of treaties that don't get a lot of attention in Washington, but really matter around the world, arms control treaties, arms trade treaties. Um, he reorients our position with respect to our allies, uh, who he clashes with. He reorients our position with respect to dictators and the promotion of democracy. All the things that I think people were anticipating as the kind of worst case scenario on that last trip, that's what's happened. Um, you see the US now playing the role that Putin had wanted to play of trying to unravel an international order, uh, trying to discredit some of the building blocks of democratic society, uh, the free press, the independence of the rule of law. You know, we, we see this play out here, and it's the Mueller report this, or it's he said something bad about some former FBI guy. Or, but underneath that, what we're talking about, which you have to remind yourself of, is this is not about like the Mueller report and whether Michael Cohen testifies or whether Trump called somebody a name. It's about the rule of law, and it's about the independence uh, in, of a free press. And, um, it's about whether the United States continues to up, uphold the international order that we built. And, and you know, these are pretty high stakes things. At the same time, there's been some resilience in the institutions that Obama spoke about. You know, there, there have been judges who pushed back here. There have been uh, media at times pushing back, uh, at times falling right into Trump's trap, but at times pushing back. Um, there's been an election, and in that election, the Democrats took back the House. Um, and so you, you, you feel that there is some, to use the word, resistance to what is taking place here. And around the world, too, you've seen the Europeans begin to think about well, what does a more independent foreign policy look like from the United States? And you've certainly seen the Chinese in the confrontation with us. Um, that, again, was eerily foreshadowed on that last trip. Uh, Obama warned Xi Jinping, the leader of China, look, these concerns that Trump has been talking about with trade that's not just Trump. Like a lot of people in the U.S. have been, you know, worried about imbalances in our trade relationship. And G, I remember, kind of pushed his talking points aside, which is very rare for a Chinese leader. And he kind of folds his hands together and he says, "Look, uh, we prefer to have a good relationship with the United States. That is good for the U.S. and China and the world." Um, but he said, "If an immature leader throws the world into chaos, then the world will know who to blame." This was in 2016. <laughs> the Chinese had seen this coming, right? Um, and so what's happened is the Chinese have taken advantage of, of this, and they're, they're rapidly expanding their influence around the world uh, in ways that I think Americans don't see in Asia and Latin America and Africa. They're trying to take our place, not in doing all the things I talked about, but in terms of being the principal economic partner and being the people who build the infrastructure and being the people who kind of uphold a different system of, of global trade. Um, all these, these changes are taking place around the world while we're living in the kind of reality show of the Trump presidency. And the, the key question then is, so where does this go? I think the 2020 uh, American presidential election will be hugely determinative of where this goes because a second Trump term, I can tell you from personal experience, the change you can make in eight years is exponentially greater than four years. It goes up each year you're, you're president. If you look at what Obama did in the second term, Paris, Iran deal, the Cuba opening, gay marriage, the implementation of the health care law, which would not have been implemented if he wasn't elected, the climate change regulations he put in place. It's a combination of you've had many years to work on things, but also a combination of like, you don't have to run for president again. You're not worried about that. You put all your people in place. That takes two or three years when you're actually appointing people. Trump doesn't really do that, but you know, <laughs> could just be Stephen Miller and you know, doing everything. Um, uh, Santa Monica High School grad. Um, and so, so eight, four more years of Trump, I, I, I think people don't fully appreciate that, that, that those next four years will look make these four years look like nothing. 
right? Because imagine Trump never having to run for president again, never having to think about that, and having been validated by a re-election. And so in terms of the international order, I don't know what's left after eight years. Uh, our alliances, you know, the, the architecture of international trade, the World Trade Organization, NATO, all these things, uh, I think that those things are really in play in a second Trump term. And, and we may just be back in kind of a pre-World War II, even pre-World War I place where it's America first and, and everybody's kind of in it for themselves and it's Trump trying to do tests of strength of the Chinese and the Chinese trying to build their block and the Europeans doing their thing. And that's where we'll be back. Um, and I should add, the consequences of this also, I think, are not fully appreciated. Because if you look at human history, there has never, ever been a time in human history when you had this kind of assortment of nationalist authoritarian characters in power in this many countries, including this many major powers, when there hasn't been like a really big war. I mean, a serious war. Like that's where this stuff goes. I'm not trying to freak everybody out, but I mean, just think about it. That's why we put in place all these rules, and that's why we built this international order, and that's why we built the United Nations, and all these things that Trump says are burdensome, those are the things that have prevented that from happening again since World War II. Never mind the fact that we won't be dealing with things like climate change or technology, right? Um, that's one way this could go. Uh, another way this could go is the Democrats could win that election. And even then, I think we're in a different world than the one we were before. Um, but I think what you'll see is essentially what Obama was trying to do, right? And, and one of the things that kind of bothers me, um, I see a couple of friends of the pod, so I apologize if you've heard me kind of complain about this before, but is this kind of notion that, well, Trump and Obama weren't that different because they both kind of complained about the need for more burden sharing in the world and they complained about the wars. And it's like, yes, but they had made some similar criticisms and reached diametrically opposed solutions, right? Obama's was to engage the world and to update the international order. And if you look at what a democratic president would do, I think they would recognize it's time to end a forever war in the Middle East and just, just get it over with, because this thing is, is holding us back. It's not moving us forward anywhere. It's time to treat climate change like the central organizing principle to our economy and foreign policy that it is. It's time to deal with an issue like global migration and refugees in the same way that we did with climate change, which is you need every country in the world to do their part. The United States, once again, could be trying to design approaches not to just turn back the clock to some glory days of the, the past, but to say, how do we reform a changing world to address the challenges that are remaking life on Earth today? Um, and, and, and there, I think there is much that can be done. I think we'll have a challenge in terms of how we are perceived around the world, because part of what worries me when I travel around the world is what concerns a lot of people in different countries is not just the fact that Donald Trump is president, it's the fact that we elected Donald Trump president, right? And so one election is not going to change that. But I think if the U.S. comes in, there's still no one else filling this role. And, and there's still no one else who's trying to articulate democratic values and trying to galvanize collective action. And so there is a way to climb back into that leadership position that is still currently unfilled uh, and try to figure out how can we build a more effective architecture for how the world solves problems and how the world cooperates. And that could actually lead us into a better place. Uh, it could lead us into a place where, yes, the United States isn't the totally dominant power, but we are the most influential nation on behalf of democratic values. We're organizing people to solve problems. Other nations are playing more of a role. And the world looks like uh, what, what power looks like in 2020, which is the Chinese have some, and the Americans have some, and the Europeans have some, and they're rising powers. And, in every part of the world, in Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, uh, we could get to a place where we are kind of finishing what I think we were beginning the Obama administration, which is this kind of transition uh, to a different type of world order, uh, one that draws on the successes of the last seven years, but recognizes that the world is changing and we have different problems and different dynamics. I think a place uh, that that I'll end before going into questions, right, is, so what, how do we think about all this? 
And because it can be very overwhelming, right? Um, th there's so many things happening around the world at any given time. You know, there's a China trade war, and maybe there's a war with Iran, and there's a Mueller report, and there's these you know, far-right parties in Europe to be worried about, and, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is grinding into uh, what seems like an impossible way to solve it. But actually, in reality, I think there's just one question in the world and that, that will determine all the rest. And the one question is, which story is going to win? There are two stories. There's a democratic story, and I don't mean democratic party, I mean small d democracy, a democratic story. And there's an authoritarian story. The authoritarian story is the oldest story in the book. As long as there have been politics, there's been a story where somebody comes along and says, all these problems, these are somebody else's fault. It's, it's their fault because they're black or because they're immigrants or because they're Muslims or wh whatever it is. And you should vote for me because I'm like you. And I'll keep things away from them, and I'll give things to you. Th that's, that's human history. Uh, that's, that's actually the easiest story to tell, right? And it takes a different shade in every country. But one of the things that's so striking to me is if you look at Trump and Putin and Viktor Orban in Hungary and Bibi Netanyahu in Israel and Tayyip Erdogan in Turkey and Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines and Bolsonaro in Brazil, and I could go on. They're, they're, they've got the same playbook. It's the exact same playbook everywhere. It's, you know, find someone else to blame. Uh, find some rich people, your, your oligarchs, who will kind of fund your campaigns. You reward them. It's a loop there. Find some rich people who will fund your media. You reward them. You've got your megaphone there. Uh, find some ways to rewrite the rules of how the democracy works. Redraw the districts. Pack the courts. This is the play. It's everywhere. The Chinese version was a little different, and frankly, a little more sophisticated. <laughs> it's we have a one-party state, and we were going to turn it into a mass surveillance state <laughs> to prevent any dissent. But it's still kind of part of the same story, it, with a, again a, a, an interestingly different um, a, a approach that um, uh, that is rooted in Chinese history. And then, so that's one story, right? And you know, Obama used to tell me, and I talk about this in the book. He it's funny, I, I, had this, uh, I had this magazine story that's written about me that's caused me a lot of grief. I don't have to talk about it that much. But um, you know, part of what the guy said is, you know, I was, this, I was a storyteller, and, 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 and I had gotten a degree in fiction writing. right? And I did. And if I had ever known how much grief that degree would give me, I, I wouldn't have done it. I would have gotten that master's in political science. Um, but you know, Obama and another one of these car rides said to me, hey, you know what that, that story got wrong? And I was like, oh, God, I don't want to talk about this story. And he's like, no, no, what, what it got wrong is it, it, it treated storytelling as something bad. He's like, you know, our whole job is just to tell a really good story about America. That's, what we, that's all we do. And, and that's what he had said to me a few times. And, and what he meant by that is not that we have good speeches or good messaging. What he meant by that is everything we do, how we carry ourselves, what our policies are, what our priorities are, what the stories are that we tell, what the speeches are that we give, has to add up to one story. And Barack Obama's success as a politician is he was telling the same story in 2004 in his convention speech that he was telling in 2017 in his farewell address. It was basically a story about the fact that democracy allows people to resolve their differences peacefully. It allows people of different backgrounds, different races and religions and ethnicities to accomplish more together than they could apart. It allows us to improve upon ourselves, to correct the imperfections in our society as we go forward. That was the Obama story, and everybody knew it. And everybody believed that he believed it, right? And if you really think about this question, it goes all the way back to our founding. The United States was founded with a Declaration of Independence that said that all men are created equal. That's one story. There was slavery in the United States at the same time. That story was present then. Throughout our entire history, there's been this competition of stories. Is this a country that exists for a few people and for their privilege at the expense of others? 
Or is this a country that is constantly working to better itself and to recognize that what makes us exceptional is our ability to better ourselves and to benefit from new immigrants and to address injustice, right? And that's been the story here, and that's the question around the world. That's a question in Europe. That's a question in a country like Brazil. That's a question in places like Southeast Asia that have enormous diversity. And the challenge is the progressive story is a little harder to tell. It's easy to just stand up there and say, yeah, you've lost your jobs, or there's an opioid epidemic in, in, in your community, or whatever it may be, and that's somebody else's fault. And so vote for me, right? To say, no, actually, the only way we're going to deal with that is to recognize that it's going to, to take all of us working together across our differences to better our society and to solve these problems. And that, that, that same democracy that we rely on at home, that's the international order I was talking about. It's the exact same approach to the world. And the reason the United States has been so perfectly poised to be a world leader is not just because we have the biggest military, it's because we look like the world. We, we were globalization before globalization existed because people came here from everywhere, right? And so we should be the people leading the right story, right? And now we're on the wrong side of that. You know, if you've got the authoritarians who say two plus two is five, and America was always a country that said, no, two plus two is four, and we're gonna write some rules that mandate that people recognize that. Now we have a leader who says two plus two is five, and that's shaking everything up at home and around the world. But I truly believe, to, to return to my initial question, you know, what if we were wrong? I don't think we were wrong. One, because I know where that other story leads, and it's a bad place. But also because I've seen where the positive story can lead. Uh, frankly, I see all that in the progress was made in the Obama administration, but you see it throughout American history, you see it in other countries. By the way, we're in a university. It's what young people everywhere want. It's not like the young people in Britain were voting for Brexit. It's not like the young people uh, are the ones fueling these far right movements, right? And, and, and so, what you and, and the reality is, there are more of what I would there, there are more people who agree with the positive story than the negative one. In most of these countries, it's minorities taking powers from majorities, and what they're counting on. The only way they can succeed is if people become apathetic and cynical and are like, well, this is just too, too messed up. Or uh, I'm off politics. You know, I, I, it's nice outside here in LA. You know? We got matcha tea and legal weed. You know? <laughs> and we don't have to think about this. right? That's what they want. right? And it, but if people actually vote, then you get the story that you want. And I look at the 2018 incoming Democratic class in the House. It looks like an Obama 2008 campaign rally. It's young, it's diverse, it's more progressive. That could be the future. Or Donald Trump could be the future. And I think the choice that we make about that in the United States is going to ripple out around the world. That's just been the history of things. People watch us very closely. And so my hope is, and my belief is, that the answer to that question, what if we were wrong, can be, no, we weren't. But I don't know the answer yet. We'll have to find out. Uh, in the next few years. So I'll stop there and happy to take some questions with the time we have left. Yeah. Oh, there's mics coming. Does this work? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, brief preface the book is outstanding. Um, I, everyone here should buy it if they haven't oh, read it. I didn't yeah. plant this, by the way. <laughs> Uh, really, uh, it, it, it's an extraordinary book, and it, it, uh, it's a humble, graceful book, and um, it, it's remarkable that you've been able to remain as calm and graceful as you have been. Ask my wife if I was calm and graceful the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> my question is, it's a hypothetical, if you had to take your life savings and wager it on one of two outcomes, that in January fourth week of third week of January uh, in 2021. There'll be Donald Trump in the Oval or a Democrat. What would, what would you do with your life savings? Well, I'll wager it on the Democrat, but I would have lost that money in 2016. So, um, but I, I, I think that um, a lot of what, what I was referring to at the end there, if the Democrats 
don't mess up. It will be a Democrat. The, 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 and that's the reality. You know, Trump's whole strategy is he's never going to get above like about 45% of the vote. So what he counts on is, can I just attack the other person and also count on them attacking each other and then count on some external variables, maybe my Russian friends coming in, to pull down that person so much that they're kind of where I am and then there's some weird third party people who are taking other votes. He's not going to rise up to 50% here. So if the Democrats run a good race and don't shoot at each other and you know, are disciplined, it should be a Democrat. Right? And that's what I would wager on. The problem is we've seen the playbook that can work for him. And, and you have to be mindful. Of what, you have to know what it's going to be. With, with him, it was, I'm a liar and I'm corrupt. So I'm just going to make her look like a liar and corrupt. So these people out there who are voting are like, well, they're both liars and corrupt. I might as well go with the guy who like, thinks those NFL players should stand up during the national anthem. Right? Um, and, and so I, I think it should be a Democrat. But it, it's, it's on Democrats to not mess that up by turning against each other by becoming undisciplined, by not doing all the things that they need to be doing to get there. Right. Um, let's go uh, there in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. You. In a world in which Trump wins re-election, oh, I In a world in which Trump wins re-election and the U.S. is no longer quite the leader on the world stage that we used to be, and China only cares about economic hegemony, who fills that power vacuum? What's interesting about it is that nobody does, and that, that's what's concerning to me. So, you know, some people talk about the, the, that as, I mean, to, to be historical here, as it, like, is this like a pre-World War II situation? It's, it's actually not. It's like a pre-World War I situation where you just got a bunch of different power blocks. You know, you've got America just kind of looking out for ourselves over here. You've got the Chinese looking out for themselves over here and kind of building a sphere of influence. You've got the Europeans just trying to stay above water over here and figuring out what their own foreign policy is. Then you've got these kind of middle powers like you know, Turkey and Indonesia and, you know, I hesitate to say, but our allies like Japan, South Korea, just trying to figure out how to navigate between these other powers. And you have the Russians, uh, again, trying to just hold what they've got and mess with everybody else. And, and that's what's unsettling to me is that, you know, you know, if you if you start to dismantle the rules, and you're taking you're taking apart treaties and the arms control regime and the global trading regime, the way in which all these countries will solve their problems is how you see Trump trying to solve his problems. Just tests of strength. I have a problem with China. I don't go to the World Trade Organization or I don't go to my allies and say, "How do we go out this conversation with China?" I just ratchet up the tariffs. You know, we have a problem with Iran. Uh, we just pull out a nuclear agreement, send an aircraft carrier there, and start threatening them, right? And, and that's, that's actually not some new innovation in foreign policy. That's, that's how foreign policy worked for a couple thousand years. And World War I and World War II shocked everybody out of that. And that's what's so strange to me about this is, is as if that never happened. People are drifting back in that direction. So again, I, think, I don't think it's a matter of people taking our place. I think it's a matter of this kind of these centrifugal forces. The one thing I will say is that the Chinese are taking our place in, in some ways that don't have to do with governing the international order, but it does have to do with influence. It's not just economic influence. Um, I'll, I'll give you a couple examples. I was in uh, one major Southeast Asian country. I won't name it. And I was talking to one of the leaders there. And, and they said, you know, the Chinese are really taking over here. And I said, well, what does that mean? Everybody hears that. And he said, well, I'll tell you what it means. He's like, our biggest infrastructure project. We'd normally have a European bid, a Japanese bid, and a Chinese bid, and we pick the best bid. Now there's only one bid. It's a Chinese bid. Or I was in Africa, I was in Kenya, and I was talking to an American diplomat there, and he said, boy, the Chinese are really coming in here. I'm like, yeah, I've heard this for years. They're building infrastructure. And he said, no, no, no. They bought five television stations. They're training the ruling Kenyan party in Beijing. They're going to foreign students who used to flock to America, and they're saying, that if you go to America, they're going to they're gonna separate you from your family or they're going to deport you, right? They're using the images, and now those students are going to China, right? So it's, it's not just economic influence. It's, it's basically soft power, cultural, who is, the, you know, we're going to be speaking Mandarin in 10 years at this rate, right? Um, or at least a lot of people are in places like Kenya and Latin America and, and, and all across Asia. So that's where I think you'd see the, the, the balance tip. Uh, but nobody's going to be sitting there 
kind of trying to organize the United Nations to do things. And that, that really matters. And I'll tell you, when Ebola broke out in West Africa, I got briefings that 25 million people could be killed. It's like, well, that's really bad. And everybody stops and kind of looks at the United States. And it's like, well, what are you guys going to do about it? And we had to go and set up a military staging zone in West Africa. And we had to go around every country and say, OK, who can give us nurses? Who can give us doctors? Who can give us money? And you know, we stamped out the Ebola epidemic. And, and who's going to do that? Right? If that happened today, I don't know who would do that. Right? So, so that's, that's what worries me, among a few other things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Preface, I haven't read the book yet, so I apologize. Um, during the 2012 debates, I think one of the questions was, who is the greatest geopolitical threat to the United States? And I believe Romney said it was Russia. Um, and there was a little bit of laughter and scoffing at it. And I'm just curious, what kind of maybe internal discussions were there? Or was he maybe just ahead of the curve at that time? No, I, well, yes and no. I mean, yes. Like, clearly, we were undervaluing the Russian threat, right? Uh, he had said, it wasn't a question. He had said something like, the, the Russia's our number one geopolitical foe. And, and I think part of it was like the Romney phrasing of foe, you know, was a little unusual. But um, the, the reality is we were uh, underestimating how much the, 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 the mistake we made is, and it was a mistake, is that in our first term, they, re they weren't our number one geopolitical foe. Uh, Dmitry Medvedev was president, and we did a new start arms control treaty with them. We were, we were supplying our troops in Afghanistan through Russia. Uh, we brought them into the World Trade Organization. They did Iran sanctions with us. They went along with the, the Libya intervention. I mean, it was working really well, right? And so when we took that position in that debate, we were thinking in terms of our first term, right? The mistake we made is we thought, you know, in that first term when Medvedev was president, Putin was prime minister. And everybody said, well, Putin's really the power behind the throne. And I think that was wrong. I think that Medvedev was actually pushing way out ahead of where Putin was comfortable, right? And, and there's a combination of Putin kind of biding his time and probably padding his pockets, but also Putin getting increasingly frustrated, like, what the hell is Medvedev doing, you know? And I actually think Medvedev represented a branch of the Russian elite that wanted to evolve a little bit more towards the West. And when Putin came back into power, he yanked that back in the other direction. And yes, absolutely, in our second term, no question, Russia uh, was either our biggest geopolitical adversary, or I think China's actually maybe not an adversary, but is still more powerful. I think you know, you, you, you know if you look at, at real power, <laughs> I think the Chinese have more, right? But so that was our mistake, and it was a mistake. Um, I think Romney represented kind of a reflexive you know, Republican view that the Russians are always the, the biggest geopolitical threat, and that's been the case for decades, and, and that he was correct in looking at Putin and saying that. I, I think at the same time, though, what's been so bizarre to watch is that the Republican Party, like, what happened to that? You know, <laughs> the, 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 You're the ones who warned us about it. They attacked our democracy, and now you're like, well, we can't even look at that, right? So the whole thing has gotten kind of scrambled in a way. I do think that Recognizing the challenge from Russia should not overstate it. Um, I, again, I still think that in the long run, you know, the Chinese economy is how many times bigger than the Russian economy? The Chinese ambitions are much bigger than Russia's ambitions. Russia is a disruptor. China is building something, right? And, and it, by the way, I'm potentially okay with that. You know, like I'm not one of these people who thinks a rising China is inevitably we're going to fight with them. Um, but it has to be dealt with. And so if you're looking at how to organize, and that's what we were trying to do by focusing on Asia, is how do we reorganize American foreign policy to recognize the reality that our chief competitor is going to be China for decades to come. Uh, come over down here. Hello. Um, so when I hear about and read about things like um, AG Barr not releasing the full Mueller report, or not showing up to a Congress subpoena, or the White House just not allowing Don McGahn to show up um, at a con 
congressional hearing. Those things scare me because they make me feel like the White House is just chipping away at our system. And it's going to get to a point where it's just going to be irreparable. And even, maybe this might be a little extreme, but if in 2020, say, Trump loses, he might even dispute the, fi the findings of the election and say, I'm going to stay because of whatever. Say it's rigged, like he did in 2016, unless he won. And I don't know. It's just, what I want to know what your take is on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Um, I mean, here's one way to think about it. Um, Everybody thinks there's like some moment when, in, you know, and this has been one of my problems with, I think, how the press looks at it. And I know some of these journalists. It's like they're waiting for the break glass moment when, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying Trump is at Hitler level, but the, the Reichstag fire happens, right? Or, you know, like what, and, and people thought maybe the Mueller report would be this moment where we just saw it and everybody said, aha, he's an authoritarian, like stop, you know. And that's not how these things happen. If you look at how this unfolds in other countries, you don't know when the moment is when we lost something irrecoverable. And one way to think about it is, if I had told you, because these things happen so fast that we don't notice it, but if I told you at the end of 2016, after the election before the inauguration, that two and a half years later, the White House would be refusing to cooperate in any way and supply any witnesses or documents to Congress under any circumstances, that the President of the United States would regularly refer to the press as the enemy of the people, and the White House would give no press briefings, and that families would be separated, uh, children would be separated from their parents and put in cages, and uh, the Muslim ban would you know, stay in place indefinitely. And so just people from these other countries couldn't come here. And, you know, and I could go down, and, and, and there'd be systematic efforts. There's a census happening, right? I don't know if people are following this. There's a census, and the census, result of the census determine a lot of things, including kind of how congressional districts are drawn, how power is allocated in this country. You know how many people they're hiring to do that census? None. They're putting some of it online, too. But do you think if you're poor and in a minority community, like you're going to be able to figure out how to fill out your census form? There are estimates. I was talking to Stacey Abrams about this last week, because she's leading the effort on this, that we could undercount in the census by 30%. What do you think that's about? You know? Um, and, and, and so I've only listed a few things, but like none of these things seem that, you know, that crazy today. But if, if, you, if someone told you that two years ago, you'd be like, that's beyond what I could ever have imagined would happen. But we get numbed to it. And it also becomes this kind of show, right? Barr, well, he spun this really well. And then the Democrats are in this, you know, what do they do? Do they impeach, but they can't have the votes in the Senate? So it, it, Washington loves to tell the story of like, who's winning the battle, you know, the battle. Like, I didn't like being investigated. But like I testified, like no, nobody like there's never been an Richard Nixon didn't like being investigated, and he you know tried to shut down. He got caught, and he's like, oh okay, you know, like this has never happened before in the history of the country that you have a president just be like, nope, no investigations, nobody can testify, no documents. Oh, and by the way, I'm not even as he said today, I'm not even going to do anything if you investigate me. Like this isn't like some Washington drama. This is like whether the democracy exists anymore. And, and by the way, this is rewarded. Like, what is the lesson after that? The thing that scares me is some people say, you know, I'm, I'm picking up that the vibe in here is probably left of center. And so <laughs> the, the conversations that happen among us are like, what the hell is Bill Barr doing? Like, why is some guy who's actually a pretty bright guy like, going all in on this? What's Lindsey Graham doing? Like, what are all these people, like, don't they worry about the cost of reputation? Not if they think that Trump is going to win. Because if that's the future, then who cares, right? And what's really scary to me is that there are actually smart people who are going all in on this because they think this is where things are going. And that, that, that's what freaks me out about this. And that's why 
the election matters so much. Because again, if this is, if people have seen this for four years, and people say, I have seen this, and I want this, right? That's very different than just Trump winning. And the media will treat it differently. Congress will take the lesson from that. And we will be in a different system, right? Um, and a system that has been set up for a long time. I mean, this wasn't just a merge with Trump. Uh, if, you know, the courts, the districting, uh, you know, the way congressional districts are drawn, the money in politics, this is like a 15, 20 year play. And we're gonna look up and you know, look at the way the Senate is gonna be representative of the American population, look at the way the courts are gonna be filled, look at the way the congressional districts have been drawn. Like we're at a tipping point on all those things. Um, and that's why people should be engaged on this because it, it's still reversible, but it feels less reversible each year that goes by. I don't know how much, when are we going to, just so I know I'm keeping time right? We've got 10 more minutes. Okay, good. Um, oh, one of my students, so I will call on him. So uh, one of the things you talked about is uh, what story is going to win. And in, in our class, we talk about speeches. And that's kind of reminiscent of the question Kennedy posed in Berlin. Was, you know, if you want to know if communism or democracy, small d democracy is going to win, let him come to Berlin. Where do you see that location today? Is that the United States or is that somewhere in Europe or even Asia? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I should also add that Kennedy said one of the speeches we read in class um, is, you know, Kennedy talks about the challenges of democracies, but he says, you know, we never had to build a wall to keep our people in and to keep them from getting out, right? Um, we're pretty good. Um, I mean, summation of essentially, I put this question to, to Susan Rice today, like, what's the story? And, and she's like, well, one story is just like, nobody wants to live with a boot on their throat. You know? I mean, there, if you really take the authoritarian story head on, there are different ways of getting at it. Um, but in terms of the place, um, the reality is, right now, the place is the internet. Um, if you think about it, um, that's where that's where these narrative that's where this really happens, right? And we talk about this a bit in class, but like sixty percent of Americans get their news on Facebook. Um, uh, you know, in Europe, same thing. In, in Asia, we've talked about this. Uh, so the reality is, what's so challenging about this is fear and negativity moves faster on the internet than hope and change. Um, because the internet is click-driven, right? And a scary video of a caravan, you know, or a scary video about refugees and what they're doing, you know, moves faster than anything other than, like, the cat video, right? Um, and so I think people need to figure out um, both what the, the story is that they can tell, and I think Obama told the story that allowed him to win twice, and, uh, very decisively. But also, like, how do you disseminate the story, right? And uh, frankly, young people, and I, you heard me say this in class, but like, this, some of this is going to be on younger people um, to figure out how to make these tools positive again. <laughs> um, because I actually, I do think that the internet is the, the true contested space. I think Washington is going to be the critical place in the next couple of years, because I think that will have a huge impact on politics, and particularly Europe and the West and um, among our allies. Uh, but the internet is where there's this competition of stories, and there needs to be um, a better coordination of, of the alternative story, because one of the things I, I see is that the right is all coordinated, they're all telling the same story. And then every country, each progressive leader is trying to figure out what the story to tell. There needs to be similar coordination, I think, on the progressive side, and then there needs to be better strategies to, to get that story out using social media. Um, we had some success with that with Obama, which was, and I've told you this in class, but like the find people where they are and just go there, you know? <laughs> Be everywhere on the internet uh, to, 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 to disseminate your message. That's one place to start. I also think it's gonna have to involve kind of some bottom-up work by people uh, to figure out how to make these technologies more of a positive multiplier and not just a negative multiplier. And it's gonna take some regulation of the technology platforms. Sorry if any of you are here today. But um, Yeah, next question, in the back there, in the hat. <laughs> 
or, or you or in front of you, yeah, waving. Hi, thanks for your talk tonight, really great. Um, obviously, it's no secret that the Democratic presidential field is crowded at this point. What are some tips and advice points that you have for us as we all sift through this field and are going to start doing our research like good democratic citizens, <laughs> yeah. lowercase d, and um, you know, starting to find candidates to advocate for? Yeah, it's a huge field. Um, and you know, I actually don't even know necessarily who I'd vote for if the thing was tomorrow. Um, there are a lot of good choices. I guess what I always tell people is ask yourself two questions. Why does the person want to be president? And why should they be president instead of everybody else? And that sounds kind of simple, but to, to build out on it, the why you should want to be president has to be a combination of who you are, what your story is, and what you want to do. Like those things have to all connect, right? And, and, and that's what makes somebody resonate, right? So when I went to a, work for Obama, those things all connected. You know, who he was, what his identity was, how he had lived his life, the communities he'd been in, and the things he wanted to do were all tied to a story of positive social change in the United States, recognized in part through a social movement and recognized in part through government action. And people kind of knew uh, that's what Obama was all about. I will say, as much as I admire her, this is where Hillary had some problems, because she had all the plans. She could tell you what she wanted to do, but she could never quite tell you why she wanted to do it that tied back into kind of her, her biography. And again, I say this with admiration, and part of the reason why is because for 30 years they defined her biography in all kinds of ways, and almost no human being could overcome that. Um, so that's the why, and, and I will tell you, and this does not mean I, I'm on, on this particular train, but Elizabeth Warren has this question answered, right? Who is she? She's someone her whole life has basically been working on the issue of economic inequality, and she's lived it, and she's thought about it, and she's taught it, and she's worked for it in government. And so all these plans that she has aren't just plans that she's decided you know, she wants to have. They're rooted in her experience, right? And that, you know, that, that's a pretty compelling why, right? Joe Biden at his best has a bit of this, right? Uh, you know, he came from this community, and that's, those are the people he's worked for his whole life. I think he's going to have to expand that story out a little bit. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the younger, I'm usually looking for who the younger person is who's coming along. And so I think between Warren and Buttigieg and Beto, they all have a capacity to assemble that, but they haven't quite done it yet, you know. But I hope they do. Um, that's, that's the why. Is it, why is this person, and then why are you different? Why are you the right person to be doing this? Uh, and that, I think, gets at both what you want to do and, 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 and whether you can, can persuade people that you can do it. You know, it's, it's not just about having, a, again, a bunch of plans. It's about what's your theory of change? You know, what's your theory about how you're going to get things done at home and around the world? Um, and again, these things can sound simple, but th they're both relevant to who is electable. Because the electable person, I, I, I got to tell you, I've, I had the experience of working for a black man named Barack Hussein Obama. Nobody in an electability factory would have designed him. And he won the biggest Democratic landslide since Lyndon Johnson. Um, you know, they design like some middle-aged white man, right, in the laboratory. So I, I think you have to toss all that out. Because what makes someone electable is whether they're authentic and, and whether people understand why they're doing this, why they're in politics, and whether they find the why credible. And whether they look at that person and think like, yeah, I can see that person as president. I can see that person getting things done as president, right? And so that's what I'd be looking for. And I hate to put it this way, but it's not just about the plans, because they're all going to have pretty similar plans, right? It's about what are their priorities, what do they care about, what are they going to fight for, right? And I think you want to get that sense and, and make that kind of gut, that gut judgment. Uh, all the way in the back there. Thank you for an absolutely Plus, exhilarating yeah. conversation, talk. Um, would you care to comment on the American involvement in Venezuela and the Russian involvement in Venezuela? Um, yeah, and I, I just got the last question hooked, so we'll make this the last question. Um, and um, I, I'll preface this because I have done a terrible job plugging my book tonight, but thankfully this gentleman uh, picked me up. Um, but this is definitely relevant to your Venezuela question. Uh, you will find in the book um, that I did this, the negotiations with Cuba. Uh, 
um, to normalize relations with Cuba. Um, and, and so I, I traced the story from when I sat down with the Cubans in the spring of 2013 and the secret negotiations over many months, the very difficult task of building trust with the Cubans, bringing in the Vatican, um, reaching these agreements, normalize relations, uh, traveling down to Havana. Um, I'll say a couple relevant things before I get to the current situation. Um, one of the relevant things is, because you asked about Russia, uh, I generally met with the Cubans when we were doing the secret talks in Ottawa at a, US, a Canadian government facility. But we were really overstaying our welcome. We've been there like seven or eight times, and we're like, well, why don't we go to Toronto and meet in a hotel? So we go to this you know, cruddy airport hotel in Toronto, and I'm checking in, and two people who were very conspicuous, they were, were, had tattoos and you know, nose rings and everything, um, they walked up to me, and they stood about a, like a foot from me, held up a camera, and took a picture of me, and walked away and started talking in Russian. Right. Um, the first time I went to Havana, I was getting a tour of the city at like 11.30 at night, and I was at one of the key sites in Havana. And same thing, two people came up, and they were talking in Spanish, and then they broke into Russian. The Russians wanted us to know that they knew that we were talking to the Cubans. And they wanted to kind of send a message, like, what are you doing? This is our part of Latin America, right? They hated our Cuba opening. They hated it. Because if Cuba opened up the United States, that's the end of Russian influence in Cuba, right? Um, so that's the first thing I'd say by way of preface. The second thing I'd say is to make that agreement with the Cubans, we had to overcome this enormous psychology of decades of ideological conflict and US intervention in Latin America that led to bad outcomes. Um, and I, I, because we're at the end, I won't go into the stories, but they're very good and they're in the book. Um, but to come up to, so where does that, what does that make me think about Venezuela? That makes me think that what the Trump administration is doing in Venezuela is a disaster for a number of reasons, right? Um, first of all, yes, Nicolas Maduro, bad guy. Uh, you know, um, Chavez without the charisma, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, he, he's, he's, a, you know, he's turned that place into a corrupt, undemocratic state. Um, I will tell you that if you really cared about the Venezuelan people, if that was at the center of our policy, and I think that should be at the center of our policy, what is good for the Venezuelan people, not what is some ideological kind of Cold War type mentality, you would be negotiating with the Cubans and the Venezuelan military and all these other countries who are our friends to say, we got to get out of this. Nobody is winning. What is a kind of unity government that can be constructed? That, that everybody can sign on to and everybody can agree to, right? And yes, it's going to involve phasing Maduro out and moving to an election at some point. But it's not going to involve just saying, we don't like Maduro, so this guy over here is president now, right? Because here's the problem. Number one, Maduro's not going to leave, right? Number two, the way that the, our administration has approached this with you know, the, trying to force him out is only going to make the Cubans and the Russians and the Venezuelan military dig in, because now it's an existential zero-sum game. And by the way, they're pretty good at digging in. And the way we've done it, too, is hurting the Venezuelan people. The sanctions we're putting in place there are making a terrible situation much, much, much worse. The way in which we've gone, gone all in with the Venezuelan opposition is further polarizing the society. You've got Maduro hunkering down, arming people, arming paramilitary groups, not just the military. So what you have is a situation where the place is completely collapsing, the place that was already polarized is becoming more polarized, and the US, completely ignoring its history in Latin America, has tried what? We've tried a military coup, we've tried to weaponize foreign assistance, which is incredibly dangerous. To use foreign assistance as a tool of regime change is incredibly cynical and dangerous. You've got them threatening invasions of military options in Latin America. Like, has nobody learned anything? The person they put in charge of the policy, Elliot Abrams, is the person who was in charge of the policy that funded right-wing death squads and Contras in Central America? Like, come on, people, you know? And I, I got to say, I'm pretty frustrated by the Democrats in Congress. Because they look at this and they're like, well, this is good politics for Trump in Florida. 
because there's some Venezuelan Cuban Americans down there are pretty hard line. So we're going to kind of be Trump light on this one. No, you should not be. This is, this is irresponsible. It's not working, by the way. So he's still there. We recognized you know, Guaido uh, six months ago and, and Maduro. So it's not like what they're doing is working. It's just hurting the Venezuelan people, polarizing Venezuelan politics. I guarantee you it will polarize Latin American politics. And you know, what's so tragic to me is because I was one dealt with the Cubans, I'm sitting here thinking, there's another way you could have done this. Like you really could have sat down with the Cubans and the Venezuelan military and the other Latin American countries and figured out an alternative path. A path that is not just sitting there and doing nothing while Maduro wrecks the country, but that is not saying, we're going to pick the new president and impose him. Uh, and they're just not doing that. And, and, and I worry about, I truly worry about where it's going to lead. Um, that's kind of a downer note to end on. Um, <laughs> Again, I will say, to try to end on a more positive note, that uh, you know, what I said about people being at the center of foreign policy, like, if people are at the center of politics and policy, like, you get really good outcomes. <laughs> like, because most people like, have a better sense of what is right and what is wrong, and what is commonsensical, and what has worked and what hasn't worked. And if we can just get back to a politics that is reflective of the actual majority of the American people, and a global politics, this is actually representative of what people around the world want from their governments, then we'll be fine, right? And that's why if people get engaged and, 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 and our politics and our governments kind of are more reflective and representative of what people believe in their own lives, we'll have better outcomes. And that's why I think, again, this is about democracy, small d, and authoritarianism. And the right side can win as long as people don't give up. Thank you.